Brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam. Um, welcome back to session number four of the history of racism and resistance in America. And I am your brother uh, Daoud with you uh, here uh, on this evening. And we are really um, fortunate to have in this session uh, addressing us, teaching us uh, is a, um, a, uh, a Muslim public intellectual uh, frequently uh, quoted in the media, has been uh, national media, in fact, international media, uh, BBC World News to uh, our local WDET and NPR speaking and commenting, and also a uh, published uh, writer who's written uh, in papers and journals. And uh, also he is a, a professor uh, at Wayne State University and also at Rochester uh, College. So without any further ado, I'd like to bring on our brother, Professor Said Khan, who will be talking to us this evening about colonialism and specifically the relationship between uh, colonialism and uh, these United States of America and touching on how uh, this is important for us to understand for the current moment that we live in in 2020 uh, here in this particular um, bizarre political moment that we have right now in American history, especially on this day in which uh, there were some uh, individuals who were arrested for plotting to kidnap our governor. With that, uh, let me uh, have uh, Sayyid Khan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, brother uh, Dawood. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much for honoring us this evening uh, with this particular uh, lesson. So I will take myself off the screen and uh, we will uh, uh, learn from your class. And then after uh, you're um, finished with your presentation, I will come back on and we will field any questions uh, that come in from YouTube or from Facebook, which we are live streaming on right now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, this evening here in Detroit, uh, wherever you might be in the world, uh, or certainly here in the U.S., uh, on a topic which, uh, interestingly enough, uh, coincides with uh, next Monday, which here in the United States, of course, is Columbus Day, but also Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, and uh, one cannot really speak about colonialism without, of course, uh, talking about uh, Columbus, his impact, and perhaps more importantly, the narrative uh, and the mythos uh, that has built up around people like Columbus and also how it then feeds into uh, even the creation narrative of the United States. Uh, many of you are probably very familiar with, uh, uh, in grade school particularly, uh, a very positivistic uh, uh, portrayal of uh, the United States uh, at its inception, whether it was the so-called pilgrims. Uh, we are here in the fall, and so uh, with Thanksgiving pending next month, uh, clearly this is the time when uh, these conversations about uh, colonialism are really at uh, perhaps their, their heightened awareness. Uh, but of course, things are not exactly framed uh, in the vein of co uh, colonialism, or even if they are, they're done so in either a very benign way or in a redemptive way. So inshallah, what we're going to look at then today is perhaps providing a little bit more clarity, uh, a little bit more intellectual honesty about this topic of uh, colonialism. So inshallah, I will share my slides uh, uh, with you, uh, which then will uh, hopefully go ahead. I don't know why. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I, I'm having a little bit of difficulty, uh, uh, Brother Daoud, with uh, being able to go ahead and do this. Please forgive me. I will change the privacy settings on this. Uh, this is a little bit uh, embarrassing. So if you don't mind uh, keeping up with me, uh, I will work through this. Um, 
Oh, we lost Professor Khan for a moment. He will be right back with us. Um, so please uh, just hold on for a moment regarding the technical difficulty that just took place. And um, while you are waiting for the professor to come back on, you are free to check out our uh, upcoming uh, class sessions that are on our website at caremichigan.org backslash C-A-I-R hyphen Michigan class uh, backslash. And uh, also uh, in regards to that, while we're waiting for uh, Professor Khan to come back, here he goes. I think we're back. Uh, we, we, uh, lost, we lost you. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to see if I can share my screen. Uh, is it is it uh, sharing? Let's see here. Um, here we go. Let's add to the screen and there we go. Let me take it myself. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, share screen. Um, ah, this I think should work. Perfect. Okay. Let me, uh, Go ahead and rewind here. Okay, so I'm, I apologize for uh, that technical error. Um, we still live in uh, at a time when it's uh, uh, it's not always reliable, and I'm certainly not reliable with that either. So let's go ahead and begin uh, by taking a look at the Americas, and particularly uh, the topic of early colonization to uh, the Americas. And in fact, it really was uh, Columbus who sails to Hispaniola in 1492. And many of us, of course, uh, were drilled into our heads with that adage uh, in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, it is uh, oftentimes presented, uh, although the narrative is uh, fortunately uh, starting to shift from this, uh, as being this wonderful moment, a liberating moment, a civilizing moment for the Americas. Uh, almost as egregiously is this whole notion, and this is so much embedded within uh, colonial narratives that uh, the colonizers are coming into an empty space uh, and are therefore developing it, settling it. Uh, this terminology is very important to understand uh, because it reinforces the nobility, uh, the gallantry, uh, the charity of colonization. And in fact, it was quite the opposite uh, of that. Uh, it's also important to uh, consider then uh, how Islam in many ways uh, played such a role when it came to the impetus for the colonization of the Americas. And here was an instance uh, that many of you are familiar with, and that is the conquest of Constantinople by um, Sultan Mehmet II or Mehmet Fateh, uh, entering Istanbul on May the 29th of 1453. It's important to remember that uh, here with the Ottoman Empire, there were a lot of other, uh, particularly Italian uh, uh, factions that were uh, located uh, in the precincts of uh, Istanbul. And they used to be embedded there because of the proximity to the major trade routes, uh, both east and west, that would pass through the Ottoman Empire, going all the way to China uh, on their way to Western Europe, and then also the north-south uh, passage coming from uh, Africa into uh, Central Europe and then into Russia. When the Ottomans now have control over this vital uh, city of Istanbul, uh, they then uh, uh, impeded the ability for the uh, smaller Christian states uh, to be able to have access to these trade routes. After all, uh, trade is certainly something which uh, invokes and engenders power. And so this was a move for the Ottoman Empire to assert itself in the area. And we find then that particularly Western Europe becomes obsessed with finding a way around this. Now the opportunity, uh, unfortunately, for uh, their venture came at the expense of Muslims in Spain. It was in 1492, and something that is not often uh, discussed in the history books here at least, uh, it was a dark day for uh, the Muslims of Spain because it was the year that uh, the Nasiri uh, kingdom the last remaining Muslim uh, vestige of power in Granada, in Al-Andalus, fell to the forces of uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Uh, 
Now, after uh, that occurs and Spain is now fully Christianized, we find that there is an impetus for uh, looking for something else to do. Uh, Portugal, which was uh, adjacent to Spain, was already starting to engage in some of its uh, voyages of exploration, and the Spanish didn't want to get left behind. This entire project was finding a way to the East Indies uh, to circumvent the Ottoman Empire and the restrictions on uh, navigation as well as uh, trade. And so we find somebody from Italy, from Genoa actually, uh, Christopher Columbus, who then makes a proposal to Ferdinand and Isabella. He's commissioned by them to go ahead and find new routes to Asia. And incidentally, the expeditions of Columbus were uh, subsidized or underwritten by confiscated Muslim and Jewish property in Spain as a result of what is known as the Reconquista, the recapture of Spain from Muslim rule. And so here we find a nice map that shows exactly how vast uh, the Muslim world was at the time. Uh, it was somewhat decentralized when, it, uh, as far as the authority came, but you had some significant uh, presences in West Africa, the Songhai uh, Empire, of course, the Ottomans, the Safavids in Persia, and then emerging uh, the Mughals in, uh, in India. So then what is the need for colonization? I mean, after all, on the one hand, uh, Columbus is looking for these routes, but there's quite a difference between colonization and what would merely be seen as trading, uh, looking at people as equal partners in commerce. Well, that word partner or equal partner is, of course, what is uh, the problem here. Colonization occurs in part because of the inability and the unwillingness of the European colonizers to see their uh, other as being equal as human beings. And so the question is oftentimes asked, well, okay, Islam has an empire which spread so expansively as to then occupy parts of three different uh, continents. What made Islam or the Islamic empire not a colonizing force? Well, I think one of the main distinctions uh, that one can make is that with the Islamic empire, as it spread, it made the lives and the livelihoods of the indigenous people better. Uh, the worst uh, possible uh, outcome was that they just simply stayed about the same. But in the case of the expansion of Islam, it was possible for the indigenous populations to then accept Islam. And also in that sense, because empires uh, had a concept of citizenship where your full rights were uh, given to you if you happen to belong to the religion of uh, the state. And so it was then plausible for the indigenous people to in fact become fully enfranchised into the Islamic uh, empire. And even if one chose not to do so, one certainly did have rights, and perhaps uh, the most important of these rights was the right to be protected by the state. And so we find this to be codified in Islamic law through the Dhimmi status, uh, whether it was in Muslim Spain from the 8th century to the uh, 15th century, or in the Ottoman Empire, or anywhere else. So I think that's an important distinction that we can then make between colonization and empire, because the colonial experience of Europe uh, oftentimes made the condition of the indigenous people far worse. What was then the impetus for this colonization? Well, it quite simply had to do with economics. Uh, one was control over raw materials and the second was control over new markets. It's important to realize that colonization, of course, had as its victims uh, the indigenous populations of those areas that were being colonized. But in many ways, this colonizing uh, project had less to do with the indigenous people whom the Europeans didn't really even see as full human beings. But the, uh, the whole conflict of the rivalry that existed among the various European countries and the almost paranoid attitudes that they had that one European country may gain on uh, another. So that notion of competition uh, was very much embedded in uh, the colonial experience. Uh, whoever gets there first gets their best, so to speak.
There's two major kinds of colonialism uh, that are worth mentioning here. One is what's called exploitation and extraction colonialism. And this, of course, uh, is as it sounds. Uh, exploit the local populations, uh, inferiorize them, maybe even enslave them, uh, and then extract as much of the resource material as possible. And usually, given the distance that's involved, pillage it and have it go back to the uh, country of origin, uh, the, the, the colonizing country. So then, of course, you see that this is a rather asymmetric relationship. It is the depletion of resources. Clearly, if uh, there was a greater level of ethics that was being involved, uh, trading uh, with the indigenous populations could have benefited both. But it was this zeal, it was this greed, which was really behind then this kind of colonialism. The other kind is settler colonialism. And here, of course, we find where people are, and again, of course, the, the, the name is, is uh, rather offensive, the idea that people are settling uh, territory as if uh, the land had to be settled uh, prior to those people getting there. This was where populations actually came and embedded themselves. Now, what's interesting, of course, is you can have exploitation and extraction colonialism without settler colonialism, but you really cannot have settler colonialism without exploitation and extraction. At the very least, there's going to be the displacement of local and indigenous populations on their land, and also perhaps even usurping their livelihood and uh, access to the resources and goods. So the first colonies in the so-called Americas uh, begin with the Spanish in uh, St. Augustine in Florida, uh, followed by Jamestown uh, in uh, Virginia, and then, of course, the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1620, Plymouth Rock. Now, notice again that one of the uh, issues that perhaps is important to examine when it comes to colonialism in America is the idea of who got here first. And given the dominance of uh, the English-speaking world and the British, uh, it wouldn't be difficult for people to think that it was actually the British who got here first. Uh, but in fact, they didn't. Uh, the Spanish were here uh, at least 50 years before. And I think that this is an important uh, fact to uh, remember and to consider, particularly in some of the contemporary debates uh, that are going about as far as whose America is it, who really belongs here, uh, who can be excluded, or who is outside the ambit of defining what a true American is. Uh, the Spanish clearly uh, were here far uh, before the, uh, the British were. You also had the French in uh, Quebec, uh, and then you also have a few others. You have the Dutch uh, who established Fort Orange in what is today Albany, New York, in upstate New York in 1624, so only four years after the Massachusetts uh, Bay Colony was established. And then they make their way uh, down the Hudson River to Manhattan. And of course, many of you know the story about how Manhattan was purchased from the Native American population there for really uh, a paltry sum of, uh, of trinkets. Uh, there was also Swedish colonies uh, in uh, the uh, United States uh, around the same time, a little bit further into the Middle Atlantic. So clearly then the Americas were in the imagination of Europeans uh, as a place of opportunity, uh, more from the standpoint of exploitation than anything else. Now, of course, we cannot talk about colonialism without talking about the, the slave transportation to the Americas. One thing that was recognized very early on, um, even by the Spaniards, was that there was going to be the need for labor in order to extract uh, those resources that were going to be exploited. And so here we find then that the slave trade begins actually in the 16th century from West Africa and makes its way to uh, locations in South America, uh, Central America, uh, insofar as it's the Caribbean, and then of course also into North America as well. And here we see, of course, a graphic uh, which uh, would be e uh, easily recognizable for people, uh, the whole notion of the black slave trade, 
Uh, here, of course, uh, a scene uh, which would be from uh, uh, southern uh, colonies of uh, what then becomes the United States. But there was another form of enslavement that also existed at this time, and that was the so-called Indian slavery, where one finds that uh, particularly the Spanish, uh, to a certain degree the French, enslaved the Native American population uh, to yield to their authority and to their rule. So again, this idea of the kind of um, lovey-dovey uh, Thanksgiving uh, scene where everybody's enjoying a meal uh, together uh, really then flies in the face of the realities of what was going on at that time. The Atlantic slave trade, of course, uh, is something that was uh, one of the darkest uh, periods of global history, uh, not just because of, as you see here, the number of enslaved Africans arriving uh, to the uh, American continent uh, over about a 350 year period of time, but the number of people who lost their lives on their way to uh, the Americas, uh, a shocking uh, uh, mortality rate uh, to be sure. Uh, happening here. And you notice that, uh, relatively speaking, uh, the number of enslaved Africans coming to what then becomes the United States is relatively small compared to a place like, say, Cuba, uh, which is uh, two and a half times that amount, and 10 times that amount in a place like Brazil. Uh, the Portuguese uh, certainly uh, trafficked in uh, slavery from Africa, uh, but they also enslaved the indigenous uh, native uh, Brazilian population uh, as well, quite brutally. All of this has to do with what is known as triangular trade, and this is the defining feature of the uh, Atlantic slave trade, uh, that being a very big part of it. And so here we find then that enslaved peoples are traveling uh, and being brought to the uh, so-called Americas, uh, they are uh, put into the position of having to then work plantations and fields for sugar, uh, which then could be processed into both molasses as well as rum. Uh, we find that there is a trade back of goods like flour, fish, and meat, uh, but then there's also uh, the movement of uh, other natural resources like lumber, furs uh, here in Michigan, a major epicenter for the fur trade, dried fish, whale oil, uh, which uh, went into uh, a series of different uses, uh, including uh, uh, for lamps, uh, iron, gunpowder, rice, tobacco, and indigo dye for uh, clothing. Uh, and then we find uh, that the process goes the other way as well. Remember, one of the uh, objectives of colonialism was also to create new markets. After all, European countries themselves were far too small to be able to take all of these goods and to process them into uh, other refined goods that could be consumed by the public. Oftentimes, they were also very expensive. Uh, the issue of trying to trade among Europeans was going to be uh, very competitive. And the other question, of course, you can ask is that why were they then taking on more resources and pillaging them from the colonies uh, than what they really needed. Again, it was greed. It was uh, the conceit that if we don't have those resources, somebody else might take them, another European country, and use them. So hoarding became a big uh, issue as well. But not to fear the way that the Europeans then handled this is that they used to manufacture goods, turn uh, uh, silk, turn cotton into uh, uh, processed uh, clothing, textiles, and then ship them back to the Americas with these newfound markets. So this is the triangular trade that used to uh, not only occur during this period, but also really defined uh, colonization with the Americas. And here's a list of how each of the various uh, colonies that then became the United States in 1776, what were they really producing? So the New England colonies of New Hampshire, the Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, you see the products there, fish, whale products, uh, including blubber, uh, big use for that, shipping, uh, uh, ship manufacturing, timber products, maple syrup, livestock, all of these things would then be shipped 
back to uh, particularly Great Britain, to a certain degree, France. The Middle Atlantic colonies of Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, a lot of livestock products, a lot of ore uh, was available here, as well as lumber and coal. And then finally, in the southern colonies, uh, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, uh, what we uh, pretty much uh, have understood to be the main uh, economic products of uh, that area, tobacco, cotton, sugar, rice, indigo, all via slave plantations, uh, as well as, of course, some other products as well. So by the middle of the 18th century, you see here a map of showing the widespread uh, colonization of the Americas. Very few regions could be said to be free of any encroachment. Uh, the dark blue area, which includes Michigan, uh, as well as, interestingly enough, uh, an area from Louisiana all the way up and past the Canadian border uh, was actually French territory. Uh, this uh, explains why in 1803, a lot of this area uh, was part of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, where uh, Napoleon then, in order to finance some of his war campaigns and ambitions in Europe, sold all of this territory to uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was the uh, president then, and it over uh, more than doubled, uh, if not tripled, the size of uh, the United States uh, at that time. You see a lot of British involvement uh, in Canada, as well as, of course, the 13 colonies, sizable area in Spain, and then, of course, you've got uh, Portugal. There was actually a treaty where uh, between these two countries of Iberia that uh, went straight down longitudinally, everything to the west would be uh, Spain, everything to the east would be Portugal. And then you had smatterings of uh, the Dutch. And as you notice along the western side of uh, what today would be Alaska and British Columbia, uh, Russian territory as well. The European uh, countries that came and colonized the Americas uh, really were in competition, rivalry, and conflict with one another. And this really uh, reaches ahead in the middle of the 18th century. So right before the War of uh, Independence in America, uh, in what are known as the French and Indian Wars, also known as the Seven Years' War. Uh, and here we find that control over the very important shipping channel from the Great Lakes through the St. Lawrence uh, River and Seaway into the Atlantic uh, was critical. And the French had ports in places like, and uh, garrisons in places like Montreal and Quebec. Uh, it was vital for the British to then uh, make their inroads into this area. And so we find then that in many ways, again, some of the same issues and conflicts uh, and animosities that had plagued Western Europe for centuries now found a new venue here in uh, the Americas. And unfortunately, the local populations uh, were compelled, forced to take sides, and many of them were the ones who actually lost their lives in uh, these conflicts between uh, the European powers here. Uh, in 1833, the Atlantic slave trade uh, has uh, certainly a, uh, a jolt to it when the British uh, abolish slavery in their colonies. And then, of course, another element of how colonization is affected is uh, the U.S. Civil War uh, from 1861 to 1865. I think it's important to uh, consider that when we're talking about colonization, uh, it doesn't stop with the American War of Independence. Uh, of course, the dominant narrative is to say, well, here were a bunch of disgruntled uh, uh, co uh, colonialists uh, who were upset at taxation without representation. Uh, they were upset about uh, uh, King George III and Parliament's uh, attitudes toward them, and they were just looking for an opportunity to be free uh, and to proclaim liberty. Uh, well, that was a fairly small and privileged group of people, uh, and we find that in many ways it didn't really change uh, the notion of colonization. Uh, there's a song by the British uh, band The Who uh, that ends by saying, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Uh, in many ways, uh, the uh, 
freedom or the independence of the United States uh, didn't really change then the underlying uh, mechanics and architecture of colonization. It was now just in the hands of uh, Americans and not the British to go ahead and control. The Atlantic slave trade still existed. Uh, the triangular trade of goods, slaves, and uh, finished products uh, with raw materials as well uh, uh, continued unabated. Uh, it was really the Civil War which then goes ahead and changes the dimensions of this uh, as a result of, in uh, part, the North deciding that they're going to Battle the South by ending slavery so that it would then cut off uh, their uh, cheap source of labor. As you recall, part of the Civil War uh, was uh, because the South wanted to be able to dictate the terms by which it contracted for its raw materials uh, with Europe, and uh, the North, of course, strenuously objected to that. When we look then at colonialism, uh, we have to understand that more broadly, uh, it was uh, being used to fuel European imperialism. And here we see a graphic of uh, the Chinese dragon, uh, and it's surrounded by uh, a group of uh, other animals representing countries and empires, uh, whether it is the German lion, the Russian bear, uh, we have uh, the Austrian uh, vulture, uh, the Japanese uh, um, leopard. Uh, everybody wants dibs on uh, another country to go ahead and exploit for resources and trade. Uh, it's important to uh, recall that Shanghai, for example, had many countries uh, established uh, there in the 19th century, all trying to control that very vital area. And so we see then that the colonial experience here in the United States, uh, the inherent racism that uh, upon which it was also founded, required the otherizing, the dehumanization of local populations, the dehumanization of others to transport, uh, to serve as a cheap labor source, uh, particularly with the African slave trade. All of this was to benefit Europe in its issues that it had with one another. And in large part, what we find then is that the colonial narrative in the early period is about raw materials, it's about control of those materials, it's about control of markets, but then it morphs into similarly controlling markets, having access to these uh, raw materials, cheap labor or free labor, so that it could fuel the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution that begins in the 18th century and then certainly continues in the 19th and the 20th century was really a defining feature for Europe. It was about making sure that they had the largest market share. It was about controlling not only areas which could then provide uh, a continuous and consistent supply of raw materials. It also then required impeding others from being able to access those uh, raw materials or even those markets. When uh, the uh, Egyptians, part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, were able to have the Suez Canal constructed in 1869, uh, a mere six years later, it was purchased by the British, due in large part to the very oppressive uh, debt structure that the Europeans had placed on the Egyptians to provide loans to Egypt to have it constructed. Uh, this, of course, was seen as a major victory for the British so that they could bring their empire together. It was seen as a slap in the face to the French who actually had built uh, the Suez Canal. But again, the notion of having navigable routes, having access to new markets, uh, the uh, humiliation of sending cotton from places like Egypt to Great Britain, and then having uh, that cotton reprocessed into shirts from textile mills similar to this one in the north of England, and then being sold in uh, Egyptian markets uh, at usually prices that were too oppressive for most Egyptians to be able to even afford that. But wherever this kind of colonization went, uh, the dehumanization of the peoples uh, was not far behind. And around this time, of course, we have the Age of Enlightenment and the uh, notion of what's called the white man's burden. Uh, 
the idea that colonization was accompanied with uh, this rationalization that in order to exploit people, in order to uh, overlord people, uh, we need to go ahead and come up with an impetus. Uh, these people are less civilized, they're barbaric, and they quote unquote need uh, Europe uh, to go ahead and civilize them. Well, there really wasn't much civilizing process. Uh, it was far more egregious than that. It was really always and only about the goods. But this is the time in uh, recent and modern history where the classification of people uh, became a, uh, a major uh, fashionable uh, element within science. Uh, it's interesting that this week uh, the Nobel Committee in Sweden is uh, announcing uh, the winners of the various Nobel Prizes. Uh, physics, medicine, and chemistry and literature have already been announced. Uh, over a century and a half ago, uh, if the Nobel Prize was being given, some of the uh, recipients would have won for their pioneering work on skull size, on craniometry, which was used to then uh, confirm by science uh, the prejudice that uh, certain people had smaller skull size, therefore their mental capacity was less. And this wasn't done within a community, this was done about entire ethnic and then racial groups. So all of that project, uh, including involving science, was done to fuel, justify, and uh, supplement uh, colonization. The entire field of anthropology, for example, emerges as a way for colonizers to study understand and then subjugate uh, cultures uh, that they would encounter. The field of sociology similarly was a way for the establishment to understand and then control the working class in their own communities coming out at a time of the industrial revolution as well. Here we see a graphic of the change to Africa. Uh, Africa was subjected to what is known as the great game. Uh, because of the wealth of resources that were available there, we see that in a uh, span of a mere 33 years, uh, an African continent which has large areas of autonomy and independence is now completely blanketed by various European countries. The only area that is really free of European encroachment and colonization are two. In the east, it is Ethiopia, uh, which is its own empire. And then in the West, uh, we have uh, Liberia, which of course was an independent country founded by former American, uh, African-American slaves. Uh, apart from that, we have the complete and total domination of Africa. Southern Africa, especially the Cape Colony, uh, was a fascinating area because uh, the Dutch come in, and particularly in the 17th century, around 1672, the Dutch bring in uh, people from the Malayas, uh, the Dutch East Indies, uh, as slaves to work in uh, the farms and the plantations there. Today, you know this population as the Cape Malay. Uh, yes, they are Muslim. And then of course, we find later on the British uh, come into Southern Africa and they bring in Indians uh, as indentured servants. So even when the British uh, abolish slavery in 1833, uh, they do not uh, end the practice of coerced and displacement uh, populations when it came to working uh, in the colonial enterprise. Uh, for some of you who've been to the Caribbean, uh, you may notice, for example, uh, these very strange names like Kumaraswamy uh, or, um, or Sharma or Rao uh, on store or restaurant names. Uh, this is because Indians were brought to the Caribbean to work on sugar plantations going back well over a century. Uh, the British did this uh, very effectively with East Africa as well, areas that then become Zanzibar, uh, which is now part of Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya as well. So moving populations around to disorient them, to dislocate them, to displace them uh, was an effective uh, ploy for social control. Here we see an example of colonization in uh, India. Uh, the British don't come into India until 
uh, before 1701 with the British East India Company in Calcutta or Kolkata. Uh, there were a couple of other uh, small colonies. Uh, the Portuguese had a presence in the West in Goa. And in the South, we have Pondicherry by the French. Uh, we had a lot of princely states, uh, independent areas, the Mughal Empire until 1857. And by 1937, you see here uh, that the vast majority of India comes under British uh, colonial rule, with the exception of a few independent or autonomous areas, uh, which were princely states, uh, which still um, had very little autonomy when it came to the British. One would have thought that the colonial era would have ended uh, by the 20th century beginning. It did not. It didn't even end uh, with uh, the end of World War I in 1918. Uh, part of uh, the problem with the end of World War I is despite the fact that there were some calls for self-determination, the two most dominant countries uh, in the post-war era were the British and the French, who very jealously wanted to hold on to their colonial enterprises. Uh, they objected very strongly and resented President Woodrow Wilson, himself an inveterate segregationist uh, as well. But coming into Paris during the Paris Peace Conference and proposing self-determination with the establishment of a League of Nations to negotiate these things. Well, uh, the U.S. Senate does not uh, ratify the Treaty of Versailles, so the United States was never a party to the Treaty of Versailles, and therefore it was never a member of the uh, League of Nations. So the British and the French were able to then maintain their colonial enterprise throughout the world. Here we see similarly in 1936, uh, the colonial uh, project is still live and thriving. And then finally here in 1945, with the end of World War II, uh, there is still colonialism uh, uh, rampant throughout Africa but where uh, the Europeans could no longer afford to hold on to some colonial projects, they start to jettison them. 1947 in uh, South Asia, particularly the Indian subcontinent. Uh, 1954 to 1962, the French in Indochina, as well as in North Africa. In almost all of these situations, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, 1960, Kenya, um, the establishment of uh, independence in places like what was formerly the Belgian Congo, Nigeria. Uh, these were brutal decolonial uh, uh, episodes. Uh, millions upon millions of the local populations were killed. Uh, and the kind of trauma, the kind of instability, uh, which still exists in many of these countries, uh, really is uh, one of the legacies of the decolonial period. So here we see a slide uh, which is called neocolonialism. And uh, it's rather graphic because you see all of these rocks um, over Europe and over the Americas, and you see a big crater in Africa. And it is a startling uh, image because in many ways that is exactly, unfortunately, what was the legacy of Africa as a result of the colonial experience. But the word neocolonialism then literally means new colonialism. And it suggests then that essentially colonialism has never really ended, or even if the old form of colonialism has ended, a new form of it has now emerged and is uh, affecting adversely many of the same parts of the world that had been under the yoke of the older colonialism. And we see this happening in the news every day, whether it is the exploitation of Africa, South America, Asia, uh, the only difference may be that some of the countries that are involved have changed, but that notion then that there is the license to exploit peoples, exploit lands, uh, extract resources, oftentimes with complete impunity, uh, that still remains. The idea of settler colonialism, that people can uh, encroach upon other people's lands with impunity and deprive the indigenous populations of rights uh, that others enjoy even though they are later arrivals, uh, 
uh, are all aspects that we should consider uh, well beyond the borders of the Americas and realize that particularly with globalization, it is in fact an international phenomenon. So Jazakallah for um, uh, your attention. Um, I will stop sharing the screen and inshallah we can move uh, to any questions that you may have. Uh, one more slide I will show uh, that uh, I'll make available to anybody is a short reading list. Uh, these are books that uh, I think you'll find uh, that can certainly expand uh, and be more eloquent on this topic than, than I can be. Uh, ranging from something very, very brief, like uh, the second book, uh, Colonial America, a very short introduction, uh, to ones that particularly look at uh, the issues of how colonialism affected uh, not only the Native American population, as with the Jennings book, uh, but also, uh, of course, had such an adverse impact on uh, African Americans, uh, and especially the displacement caused by slavery, with Klein's book on the Atlantic slave trade. And then of course, uh, the book um, uh, talking about settler colonialism, race and law, and how we still have the legacy of that with structural racism here in the United States. So uh, with that, I will just end that slide. Uh, thank you very much for your, your presentation. And before um, in uh, audience, if you have any uh, questions, uh, you can pose them and we can share them with uh, Professor Sayyid Khan. Um, I really liked how you ended it off. And I hope that people who are watching right now live or those who will watch it later on uh, will be able to see that there's a definite connection uh, that you drew in your presentation between uh, racism and economic exploitation abroad and its impact here and vice versa. So when we're talking about um, economic justice or even the issues of racial justice here in America, then we also need to have a lens of how that plays itself out internationally and vice versa, how those effects can even uh, um, have domestic consequences. So um, I really like how you did that and showed that in terms of the, the really unbroken chain of colonialism that uh, this country was started uh, upon, or this land uh, was first colonized, and how there's really an unbroken chain that goes on uh, to this very year of, of 2020. So I appreciate that. Uh, are there any questions from the, uh, the audience? We'll give uh, a moment. There are some uh, comments of people who are watching and uh, thank you for the for the presentation said it was very valuable and necessary especially for first generation muslim americans and their children is what one commenter had we also have um our colleague from uh our care office in connecticut right now one of the board members who's watching right now from lexicon kentucky i, I said i said care connecticut i meant care kentucky excuse me so I'm gonna post this question right here. Okay. Uh, from Sister Julia, there we go. Why do you think it's still so difficult for white Americans to understand colonialism and white privilege today? Okay. Jazakallah khairan for the question, uh, Sister Julia. Uh, I, I think before somebody can go ahead and understand a problem, they have to realize it is a problem. And uh, I, I remember coming to the United States at the age of eight from Great Britain. And uh, one of my first indoctrinations to American history, uh, as I think oftentimes happens for young kids, is uh, uh, there was a show called Schoolhouse Rock. And uh, these were these little uh, uh, snippets of uh, history and other things. Uh, this is sort of pre-Khan Academy, uh, pre-internet, you could learn about numbers, you could learn about multiplication. And I remember uh, there was uh, the one about how America started with the American Revolution. And uh, it was, of course, cute because it was a cartoon, but it was completely outside the realm of anything that we would understand today of the complexities. It was always seen again as this idea that 
a bunch of people were escaping religious tyranny and uh, religious persecution in uh, in uh, Europe, uh, and they came here to seemingly a blank slate, and they went ahead and uh, through their toil, through their commitment, through their perseverance, they improved the land here. Uh, they were not making any waves. They got along with the local people. They broke bread with uh, the, the indigenous thing. That is such a complete distortion of what really happened. Now, notwithstanding what might have been the push factors for them to leave uh, uh, Europe, the fact that they came here and became exploitative themselves, maybe not on behalf of the state that they left behind, but the fact that they then seemingly forgot to bring their empathy over uh, as well, that one would think that being displaced people themselves would in fact allow them to have empathy, uh, a sense of uh, gratitude, maybe even a sense of indebtedness. I mean, I always think back uh, when I'm teaching in my early Islamic history class and I talk about the, the Muhajirun reaching uh, Yatrib, that what must have been that sense of uh, feeling uh, as though the gratitude is something that they can never fully repay, uh, always feeling uh, that, that, that sense of uh, empathy, that sense of awareness that uh, I am the beneficiary of other people who are my hosts. Uh, that is something that we really don't see at all in the colonial narratives of Europeans coming here. And so if we already have that embedded, that there is a sense of being oblivious to uh, these things. I mean, I guess the analogy I would use is like, there's always somebody that we know who when you go out to eat, uh, never picks up the check and somebody else always does so. And they're oblivious to the fact that other people pick up the check. And so here we find then that I don't think that uh, people comprehend, first of all, that America has a far more complex history. Second of all, how they have benefited from the toil of many people. They've simply sort of taken it for granted. And then, of course, there's this other issue that... Uh, plagues people who either are guilty or who become defensive. Well, that happened so long ago, why are you sticking me with the bill? So I think all of these things have uh, a lot to do with uh, the notion of why privilege isn't really understood uh, uh, by people, why they don't understand uh, uh, colonialism. One more thing I think that needs to perhaps uh, be said to help when we do discuss colonialism uh, and uh, issues of white privilege with with uh, the white Americans is, as Brother Daoud um, uh, uh, articulated, uh, understand how race and economics are so intertwined. And one of the things that we need to understand as well is that even within, um, say, the so-called white population, the socioeconomics are ones that then uh, act against some people within the same race. And oftentimes it becomes a matter of a diversion for them to then feel uh, envious of people of a different color, blaming them for their own uh, status and their own marginalization and recognizing that that marginalization is actually caused by people who have power over both uh, people of color uh, as well as them based on class. So it is a complex uh, uh, concept. Uh, colonialism is not just about race, um, but it is also about the economics and what we would call class or class consciousness and class exploitation. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, and Sister Julia, um, just to add on what Professor Khan said, which was very eloquent, um, and really I'm just, um, putting an exclamation point on one point that he said, but um, there's a really interesting book. If you ever had the chance to read it, those in your viewing audience, it's called Mis it's called uh, The Miseducation of the Negro. It's written by Dr. Carr G. Woodson. He is the, um, the second African-American to ever have gotten a PhD from Harvard University. The first was W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folks. But the point that I'm getting to if you read Dr. Woodson's book, is that it, 
in the history of America, it just was not a miseducation of African Americans or black folks, but there's been a general miseducation uh, of the American population. And just as black Americans have been miseducated, white Americans have been thoroughly miseducated, which gives white, many white Americans, not all, a false sense of superiority and actually uh, certain rights they feel that are inalienable and inherent to them that perhaps aren't inherent to other people. And uh, Professor Khan also mentioned how this envy can come out and how uh, economic exploitation works to disempower white people uh, is um, an example that uh, Mr. Trump um, unintentionally highlighted when he wanted to hold that public rally at first on Juneteenth in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And a lot of Americans learned about the uh, the massacre of, of Black Wall Street, where you had a group of white Americans who felt that they were uh, marginalized and economically disempowered. And they uh, perceived Black people in, in that area to be living a little too good. And they felt that they deserved it, and not, not realizing that some of the interests that were um, marginalizing Black people around Tulsa, Oklahoma, and other places were the same people economically um, exploiting them, but they took their anger out on Black people and burned down the uh, the Black business district that was known as Black Wall Street. So uh, that's a historical example uh, that relates to uh, what Professor Khan just mentioned. Uh, let me put this comment up from Sister Julia, and she thanks you for the response. Thank you for your response. Absolutely. The empathy and appreciation is really missing over and over again. It makes me wonder why Europeans were so lacking in this on a broad scale. I'm a convert of European descent and a history teacher. So it's very troubling. Well, again, thank you for uh, thank you for those kind words, uh, Sister uh, Julia. One of the things to then recognize, and, and uh, you can appreciate this as a history teacher, there's always a point that you can go further back uh, to then try to see this kind of chain of, of causation. And in the case of Europe, remember that around the end of the 17th century, Europe had just come out of over 150 years of flat out war with one another. The Protestant Reformation, and even think about the Protestant Reformation. I mean, here Martin Luther has his issues with the Catholic Church, uh, the hypocrisy of selling pardons, uh, again, economic uh, issue that only the rich can uh, get a get out of hell free card, uh, or pay for it at least. And the Protestant Reformation happens, it starts in the year 1517. The Muslim world was doing fine. In 1517, the Ottomans uh, uh, conquer Egypt and make it part of the province, and they bring the caliphate back to uh, Istanbul. And then for another 150 years or so, Europe is embroiled in these wars that finally end in 1648 with uh, the Peace of Westphalia and the concept of the modern nation state. So Europe basically loves to say about how they solve the problem with, uh, with uh, the Treaty of Westphalia. But in order for them to coexist uh, peaceably, they had to actually separate from one another. And they separate into little nation states, which are brought together by a common religion or denomination, a common race, common ethnicity, common language, common culture. Um, that doesn't sound like diversity. That sounds like you're just sort of separating into different areas. So in many ways, the furniture in, in the European mind has now started to shift. And for them, the moment you start seeing yourself as one group, you automatically are otherizing the <clears throat> rest. And so it then became all the more easy for Europe to start to define and categorize people who weren't even European uh, when they were on their colonial um, experiences and, and on their colonial exploits. So we, we kind of have to take a look at where colonialism fits into this broader arc of European history. And, and I really invite, uh, actually implore, uh, particularly um, uh, my uh, Muslim brethren out there, that in order for us to understand what is going on, we have to really understand uh, 
particularly European history, Western history. Um, I teach a graduate course on Islam and the challenge of modernity. And these are very, very um, uh, significant streams that we talk about there. Uh, because the West uh, consigned the entire Muslim world to an, a similar intellectual exercise called Orientalism. And uh, the late Edward Said, in fact, in 1978, wrote a book called Orientalism, which really changed academics. And in many ways, we have to do the same thing in reverse, where we have to become better students and scholars of the West. What has caused these anxieties? What has caused, I mean, because in many ways, I think it's safe to say that the West, since it embarked on this project of modernity, is uh, an abused child. And remember that uh, those who have been abused then become uh, perhaps inclined toward committing abuse themselves. So we have to get down to the, the core of what are these uh, issues, what are these pathologies, uh, and we have it actually as more of a challenge. Orientalist scholars in the 18th century studied the Muslim world without ever actually having gone to the Muslim world. We don't have that benefit in that sense. We are we don't have the benefit of distance. We live in the West, and so as a result of it, it is incumbent upon us uh, to the, uh, uh, enter into this kind of a study. And uh, as a result of it, I think we also provide a very unique perspective that we are from, in many ways, the Orient. Uh, irrespective of whether uh, we uh, uh, come from Asia or not. Uh, Islam allows for uh, a, a different kind of perspective than what the West has created. Uh, but living in the West, we, we serve as conduits. Thank you for your additional comments. We'll give another couple of seconds for any other uh, questions that come across. In the meanwhile, uh, just to let you know that next week's class will be at 7.30 again. CARE Michigan Staff Attorney Amy Ducore will be uh, teaching that one and we will be going over slave codes in, uh, in America. Slave codes will be the next uh, class. And I think that along with the next one will be very important for us to understand the 21st, uh, the 21st century methodology of policing in America is very important for us to go back and understand uh, slave codes and policing um, in, uh, in the United States of America. Um, I will share this last comment right here uh, from uh, Sister Julia. I could not agree more. European history affected and changes and tragedies globally in an irreversible way and it is absolutely crucial for us to speak that language. Thank you for sharing that, Imam Daoud. I will look for that book and share it with my students and hope to a better inform them. Thank you both again <clears throat> and why yakum to you. And, and yes, um, for those of you who are uh, watching this, these, uh, these videos and these types of classes, it's essential in this particular time to share this information in particular with our, our youth and our people who are in high school and uh, so that they can get a better sense about what uh, the current political discourse is going on right now when they're watching the, uh, the presidential, vice presidential debates and even what they're hearing in their classrooms, that this type of background information will help them in kind of um, decoding and, and, and better inf uh, what's going on uh, right now and, and better inform them. If I can uh, give a final comment to you. Inshallah. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, why also I would suggest that this is so important, especially for our young people to understand, is that we are, uh, as, as, as a globe, uh, undergoing a tremendous uh, transformation right now. Uh, given the dominance of the the electoral cycle on the news. We really don't hear about these things, but if you want to understand uh, with what's going on, for example, in Azerbaijan and in Armenia, what's going on in Xinjiang with the Uyghur, uh, what's going on with Turkey, um, we are on the threshold of a complete shift when it comes to what we have seen as the dominance of the European model. And with the rise of China, and with its own form of colonialization, uh, 
uh, and its projects in Africa, in the Middle East, and, and, and throughout Asia. We need to understand then uh, not only the various concepts and dynamics of col uh, colonization, but we also have to be prepared for understanding that whether or not the society in which we live has the shock absorbers to withstand that kind of change to it. Uh, we see some of these as microaggressions, but macroaggressions are, are certainly possible. It's difficult for a project that has been going in a particular direction for two to five centuries, all of a sudden now to face the challenge that it's not at the top of the food chain anymore, that it's either going to have to share that or that it's going to be subordinate to uh, this other one. Those kinds of things, even though some people I know might look at this as a moment of celebration, uh, are moments of, of tremendous trauma. And so it's important for us then to be equipped with both the knowledge, inshallah, as well as uh, the understanding of how to prepare uh, for these kinds of changes and uh, to prepare for the kinds of adaptations that we have to make to move beyond some of the presumptions by which we conduct our lives today. And with that, we will conclude uh, this evening's class. Again, thank you uh, very much. And uh, Professor Khan will be uh, lecturing at another class later on in this session. So uh, you will have the uh, the opportunity and the pleasure uh, with Allah's permission to hear him again. And again, uh, we will see you all next week, inshallah, uh, next Thursday, 7.30 p.m. with the history of slave codes in America. And with that, we thank you. Please pray for Professor Khan and his family and pray for us at CARE Michigan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.